So welcome back. It is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Steve Fluharty. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Fluharty, Dean of Penn School of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you as we continue the Perry World House grand opening today with this panel, The Role of Religion in Global Politics, an Interfaith Discussion. This panel, like the others in the opening celebration, highlights not just the important relationship between Perry World House and the School of Arts and Sciences, but it also demonstrates the pressing need for interdisciplinary inquiry in addressing today's most greatest challenges. Arts and Sciences faculty and students have long represented a critical hub of global activity at Penn. And the broad areas of global inquiries and public policy and social impact are two of the core priorities of our current strategic plan. Today's panel's focus on religion is a perfect example of the many ways that Penn Arts and Sciences contributes to global studies. Some may associate us with our eminent faculty who study religion's impact on global history and culture going well back to ancient times. And we are indeed proud of them. But we are also proud of a thriving community of scholars doing work on contemporary global religion, which is front and center in so many policy discussions on the current world stage, as will be discussed much more here today. This is why we in Arts and Sciences are so excited about the high profile outlet that the Perrig World House will offer our faculty doing work that has contemporary policy relevance. Among our incoming faculty just added this academic year, we have professors working on state building in Mongolia, on what makes international economic institutions effective, on why civil wars happen, on Haitian social and political history, and on religion in modern South Asia. And that's just our faculty. Our students are also studying these topics and doing advanced research on them. Moreover, Arts and Sciences is not just the largest undergraduate school within Penn, but its undergraduate students, as well as its graduate students, come from all parts of the world. All of this makes Penn Arts and Sciences a vital partner of Perry World House. Our faculty and students will not just use this space, it will help set its agenda. The fact that our faculty member, Michael Horowitz of Political Science, who many of you have had the opportunity to meet today, is the Perry World House Associate Director, reflects what is already a deep level of engagement between these two entities. Arts and Sciences looks forward to a very fruitful collaboration with Perry World House in the area of global public policy and beyond. Let us now turn to this afternoon's program as I introduce our moderator, John Dulio. Please note that in order to maximize time for discussion, full bios of the moderator and panelists can be found in your program. John is the Frederick Fox Leadership Professor of Politics, Religion, and Civil Society here at Penn and Faculty Director of the Fox Leadership Program and the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society. His career beautifully exemplifies the importance of connecting academia and policymaking. His distinguished scholarship focuses on American government and politics, US public leadership, administration and management, religion, faith-based social service delivery programs, and not-for-profit organizations, as well as US healthcare policy and its administration. He is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and has directed research centers at major think tanks. From 2001 to 2002, John served as the first director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives under President Bush, and later assisted the Obama administration in rebuilding and expanding that office. John's civic engagement spans many, many other realms. In 2014, he launched a multi-university effort through Fox Leadership International to develop a new generation of China, US educational and cultural exchange programs for young adults, students, and leaders in both of the nations. In fact, 
John has just returned <laughs> from Beijing and may be looking a little tad tired. But he will rally. Yeah, I will. I, I assure will. you. I will. And through Penn's Fox program, he's been engaged since 2006 in the ongoing re recovery process in post-Katrina New Orleans. Outside of academia, his work and its important continues. John has developed programs to mentor children of prisoners, provide literacy training in low-income communities, reduce, reduce homicides in high-crime police districts, and support inner-city Catholic schools that serve low-income children. Please join me in welcoming my cherished colleague and friend, John DeLeo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you so kindly. Uh, it's very nice when your dean talks that way about you, isn't it? It's really, really good. Uh, I am tremendously honored to be here. I really am, uh, and uh, th with this extraordinary panel. And um, I would like to uh, just begin by setting uh, a few, having a few remarks, and then turn to very brief introductions, and then get right to a question that I'll ask each panelist. So. Just a generation ago, it was very common for scholars and others to talk about the declining significance of religion in world affairs. And the idea was that religion, whether it was viewed as a tonic or a toxin, uh, whether it was viewed as mainly a force for peace and cooperation or for persecution and conflict, was on the wane. It was not going to be that significant by the time we reached the mid-21st century. But today, of course, we know differently. We know religion uh, is a growing force, if anything, in global affairs, whether for good or for ill. And we know that many of the most complicated and certainly many of the most consequential and controversial uh, questions about global affairs are at that intersection of religion and politics. We are therefore especially uh, fortunate, dare I say blessed, uh, to have with us four extremely distinguished leaders, each of whom has dedicated much or all of his or her adult life to working with and in and across and beyond uh, transnational and other religious communities. So I'm going to briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists, and then following that, I will pitch an opening question uh, to each uh, of our panelists and, and have them address it in five to seven minutes. Then I will open the floor to the audience uh, for your questions and comments. And then finally, uh, I will ask to the uh, podium, ask to the, uh, to the panel, uh, Perry Worldhouse Deputy Director LaShawn Jefferson for a brief address and bring us to a close. So to begin the, in the brief introductions, to my far left here, Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Soronado is Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Monsignor was born in Buenos Aires and was ordained a priest in 1968. He was the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy at Lateran University in Rome. In 1998, he was appointed Chancellor of the Pontifical Academies of Sciences and of Social Sciences by St. John Paul II. Next to Monsignor, Mr. Majid Nawaz is the founding chairman of the Quilliam Foundation, which is a globally active think tank focusing on matters of integration, citizenship, identity, religious freedom, extremism, and immigration. His autobiographical account of his life story, Radical, has been released in the UK and the US, as has his second co-authored book, Islam and the Future of Tolerance. He also provides occasional columns for London Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other outlets. Reverend Luis Cortez is the founder and CEO of Esperanza. Founded in Philadelphia in 1986 and still a very active community serving network here in Philadelphia, Esperanza has grown into a national network of more than 13,000 faith based and community organizations. Reverend Cortez has served on the advisory committees to President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama as well and he has been featured as one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential evangelicals in America. Last but not least, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum is the senior rabbi, the congregation of Bayit Simchat Torah. I couldn't get quite the in there, I tried, I tried, did my best. Okay, well, we just do that to push the Okay, people. okay. <laughs> rabbi Kleinbaum uh, was the congregation's first rabbi, and first leader in 1992. And she has really guided it to its present place of prominence as one of the most important religious congregations in the country on issues of equality and social justice. For many years, uh, she has been ranked by Newsweek among the 50 most influential rabbis in America. 
So, my first question is for you, Monsignor. When Pope Francis was elected in 2013, I understand that the first, one of the first things he did was send you a note suggesting that it would be good to examine the issues of human trafficking, modern slavery, and the organ trade. So my question, my opening question for you, Monsignor, is why is Pope Francis, as, one of the, as the head of one of the world's main religions, largest religious groups, why is he so committed to the eradication of modern slavery and these other ills? And even more of interest, how's he going to get it done? <laughs> OK. Thank you for the invitation. And congratulations for this building that I understand that we some kind of inauguration today. And also because you invited these very important people that we can speak. And really, I don't know what is the, the, the motivation of the Pope, but, <laughs> but I think clearly that uh, the, the more important motivation is the, the love to, to the people and especially to the, to the people to suffer more. Uh, and in, I think in the end is the motivation to follow the message of our foundator, Christ, that uh, as you know, his program was the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes is this, blessed the poor people, blessed the people to find justice, blessed the people to suffer for justice, Blessed the last one, he say, the protocol of the last judgment is what we do for the people to need more. The last one, our brothers, last one brother. I, th I think this is the real motivation. And uh, this motivation is in coincidence with the humanity, with the problems of humanity, the exclusion of the last one. But uh, it really was a revolution in, in our academy, because where our academy was habituated to, to study the problem of the governance, the problem of the globalization, that are very important problems, but not so concretely to go to the people that suffer and this kind of things. And uh, uh, as you know, the Pope considered that this, uh, the, the, these things are the more extreme form of the globalization of indifference. Uh, the, the, more, the more incredible forms are uh, the, the new form of slaves, the human trafficking, the problem of the forced labor, the problem of prostitution, forced prostitution, but prostitution also, the traffic of organs, the, the organized crime, and these are really the Pope said, crime against to humanity, grave crime against to humanity. And I finish uh, to say this, that the first things that the Pope suggested to do is organize a meeting with the, the, the very important religious leaders. Because he considered after the Vatican II, after the dialogue, ecumenical dialogue for the Christians, an interreligious dialogue for all the religions, that the religions, as you say in your introduction, are the soul of the culture. And to convince it, the public opinion, the government, we need the force of religions that are present in the world today. For this reason, he invited a, a very important representative, Al-Azhar, to represent the, the Muslims, one of the tradition, and also the, the imam of Iran. And uh, we have also two rabbis, very important, Ross, Ross, and the other rabbi that is friend to the Pope in Argentina, uh, Shoka. And uh, we have also a representative of Isha, uh, this lady, Ama. And the, the substance of the message was to defend the human dignity and the freedom of the people we need not only to speak together, to have dialogue. In the basis of the dialogue, we need to act, 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 to defend the humanity, especially the people who suffer more. And this was our work. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Nawaz, um, in your bio, 
uh, it states, I'm going to quote directly from the bio, it says that your, your work has been deeply, quote, informed by years uh, spent as a member of a global Islamist group and gradual transformation toward liberal democratic values, close quote. So if I may, a two-part sort of question for you. First part is, what do you believe, based on your own incredible experience, what do you believe to be the most important factors or ways of going about achieving broader religious tolerance and toleration among and between people of different faiths and people of no faith? But secondly, or in, in conjunction, what do you believe to be the most significant challenge for Muslim populations that are now displaced by conflict and persecution in non-Muslim countries? Hmm. You've just asked me to solve the world's problems. <clears throat> well, that's what we're here for. <clears throat> How long do yeah, I have? Yeah. Seven, seven minutes, yeah? <laughs> In seven minutes, so uh, religious tolerance and uh, some of the challenge, challenges that Muslim populations face in, in non-Muslim non -Muslim country. countries. So in other words, diaspora communities and those born and raised here as minorities. Um, so the first point about, first of all, thank you. And thank you for inviting me here again. Just to repeat, Monsignor Sarando's comments, it's an honor to be here on, on this day and, and to be a part of opening this uh, wonderful new center, which, uh, which I, uh, remain hopeful, continues to do many, uh, many great things going forward. Um, expectations are set high, and it's your first day, and I hope that um, uh, they continue to remain high as you. You, as you carry on. Uh, <clears throat> my second book was a dialogue with Sam Harris, and it explored this very question of religious tolerance, in particular with relation to Islam and the future of potential reform for Islam. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I think it's important for me to begin to just a caveat to say that I'm not a religious leader, um, but rather I am somebody who's had years of experience in this and uh, discusses mainly in the policy and public advocacy field, but remains committed to my Muslim identity. And though I don't hold myself out to be a religious leader, I obviously have thoughts and ideas around what is, I think, one of the biggest questions of our age. Uh, which is the subject of this panel and the rise and the role of religion in, in geopolitics. It's an unavoidable issue to address. Um, and that second book explores the way in which uh, potentially Islam today, if it were to go through some form of smaller reform, and I use the word reform rather than reformation deliberately because there are stark historical differences in the two experiences, that it could play a role in contributing to religious tolerance. Because currently, as it is today, and not as it was historically, it's playing a significant role to contributing to religious intolerance as well. And I think we have to be very candid and frank about that. It's, there's no point, as some of our political leaders try and do, in denying what is the obvious, and that is that Islam today is playing a disproportionate role in encouraging some form of intolerance between and within Muslim communities. So, but it can play a very powerful role in the opposite direction, in the tolerant direction. And how I think it can do that is actually there's ample historic and theological precedent in the past where it, it did do that. <clears throat> now, all of these examples I could give are, of course, relative. If I point to the um, Andalusian period of Islamic Spain, in which there was a bit of a golden age and an intellectual period that informed, I believe, the Enlightenment in Europe, uh, while Europe was in its dark ages. By today's standards, Andalusia and Spain under the, um, the Umayyad breakaway faction who were on the run from the Abbasid takeover would certainly not be considered secular liberal Democrats. But relative to the standards of their day, because of course we now have the benefit of hindsight and the accumulation, accumulation of knowledge that has landed us in this position where we have come to appreciate secular liberal democratic values, by the accumulation of knowledge as they had it till that day, they did represent the best of what humanity could achieve. And that's why the sciences under uh, Andalusia and Spain, under the Islamic period there, uh, flourished. So what we know about that period uh, is not only that the, the golden age, even in the Abbasid era, <clears throat> not only that the sciences flourished, but there was also, due to, by and large, the absence of a Sunni Islamic clergy, Religion didn't tend to interfere in scientific, scientific advancement and in political discourse and in how 
that social contract was settled between the people. Um, Sunni Muslims have never had a clergy in that sense. Of course, uh, uh, Monsignor mentioned the Azhar University, who went to see the Pope. And by the way, I'm incredibly encouraged by the Pope's overtures towards Muslims. And the fact that he uh, made it one of his first public gestures to wash the feet of a Muslim woman was an, a, a very important and symbolic gesture considering the world climate at the moment. Um, but you mentioned Al-Azhar University. Al-Azhar is one of the leading Sunni schools of theology in the world, yet still doesn't have any religious authority over any other school of learning in any other country. And that absence of the clergy historically did also encourage dialogue between Muslims because no one had authority over another, and also between Muslims and non-Muslims. If that was the case historically uh, 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 and theologically in the, in the absence of a clergy which led, for, uh, led to a flourishing debate, what's happened of late with the rise of what I call Islamism is a, a, a brief sentence description of that, a desire to impose any given version of Islam over society, is in that understanding of the word is ahistoric to the way in which Islam was traditionally and has been a reaction to uh, many factors, colonialism being one of them, um, <clears throat> the influences of well, sort of post-World War I, pre-World War II European politics, uh, and many other factors have contributed to the rise of what has now become the predominant ideology in many post-Arab Spring countries, and that is this Islamist ideology, mm -hmm. to, the, to the point where it you know, hijacked certain uprisings as well. But if it wasn't always like that, then there is a way forward, and that is to, that way forward has to be organic, so it's, to, it's necessary for us to rely on uh, historical and theological precedents that are organic to Muslim communities, and the second book with Sam Harris was about that, it was to draw out some of those. But while doing so, also to, to acknowledge uh, that even though traditionally Islam was relative to other countries more progressive in that sense, that it wouldn't be considered progressive today if we just stuck to that tradition as it was in the medieval period. And that's why I say that though um, there is a role for Islam, uh, even without Islamism, that Islam today needs to be reformed as it always has been to catch up with, with the times, but it, but it is possible. So in that sense, Islam can play a huge role in contributing to religious tolerance as it once did in the past. Muslim minorities in the West, I, I've gone on a bit, so I'll just keep this bit short. Uh, but you did ask me two questions. Yes, I did. And that's cheating. Yes, I did. Does that double my time to 14 yeah, minutes? It's not quite. 14 <laughs> minutes to solve the world's problems. Um, <clears throat> yes, I could try and talk faster. Muslim populations and Muslims as minorities in the West. You know, these questions are tied, and perhaps that's why you asked them in the way you did. did. Um, because based on my first answer, this is a natural segue to the second, which is that actually part of that reform of Islam today could be and should be, in fact, led by Muslims who have come to appreciate secular liberal democracies living as minorities in the West, because they realize, uh, I think the previous panel were discussing right at the end about the definition of democracy and not separating democracy from protecting our minorities. And I endorse that comment, because Muslim minorities in the West realize the importance of secularism, the importance of protecting the rights of minorities, because they are living as minorities. And if we can somehow translate that experience through the discourse and through globalization to Muslims in Muslim-majority countries, um, through that human-to-human, Muslim-to-Muslim uh, diplomacy, we could begin to spread the message of the, the fact that secularism and minorities' rights are not against Islam and Muslims, but rather are also in the Western context in our favor. And I think that the Muslims in minority context could be the best ambassadors for that message, that actually, look, you know, we may be 3%, I, if you haven't noticed, come from the United Kingdom. I'm not speaking in a, <laughs> a Pennsylvania accent. It, you know, we, I thought it was a Philadelphia accent myself, yeah, yeah. but that's, a, that's all right. So we, we um, are maybe 3% of the United Kingdom, uh, but that 3% needs protection yeah. as a minority, and, and no democratic country uh, can be considered fully civilized unless it protects its minorities. Well, Egypt has about 15 depending on who you ask, 15 to 20% Coptic Christian. And so to our fellow co-religionists who are Egyptian Muslims, the rest of that was 80% or whatever, um, that the importance of protecting the minorities um, and, as, uh, and, and using that as a catalyst to encourage 
a more secular approach in these countries. Uh, realizing the significance of that could come through those who are minorities in the West who have fully internalized why that is such an important thing. But I do believe that no de democracy is complete simply if it has majority rule and, and wins uh, an election. Uh, I think intrinsic to democracies are concerns for individual liberty, free expression, freedom of and from religion, and by definition, therefore, protecting the minorities within our own countries. Thank you very much. I think you solved it. I do. I do think <laughs> you solved it. <clears throat> Reverend Cortez, um, I have uh, been privileged to watch up close and personal uh, the growth of your Esperanza network uh, from here in Philadelphia to this national network of more than 13,000 uh, organizations in the Hispanic community. And my question for you uh, really goes to one of, I think, the great legacies of your work to date. I know you're not done by a long shot yet. Um, but you were able to persuade a lot of people while focusing on issues having to do primarily with you know, Latinos and the Hispanic community and the growth of that community and immigration. You were able to persuade successive presidential administrations, I would say, to look at the role of Latino sacred places in, 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 in providing and serving a civic good, uh, sacred places serving civic purposes, a whole range of not only social services, but a whole range of advocacy and referral services and so on. But we've come to sort of an impasse uh, in our domestic and perhaps our international politics in this regard. And I just wanted to ask you in particular, as you look ahead, as someone who spent the last 30 years growing a religious network here in the US, but also with lots of connections uh, to folks uh, uh, all around the world, what do you see as the major challenges for religious organizations in the US, and in particular with respect to your own organization and the issue of immigration, both here and abroad? Two, you get two seven and a half minutes. Yeah. Two questions. Never invite a Hispanic Baptist minister and give him seven minutes. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. But I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Um, there, I guess there's two challenges, as you mentioned. Um, one is the challenge of secularization in, in the United States. Um, it's both good and bad. It has its, uh, its rough edges. But for the religious community, um, not just the Hispanic religious community, but for the religious community, the question of what is the role of religion in the public square? And should it be shut down? And at what level does the line become a, a hard line where folks are not allowed to practice or to state things they want to state out of their religious understanding of the world? What's your epistemology? How do you think the world functions and the world should function? And for, for us, um, as Hispanic, um, the Pew religion um, folks have told me that Hispanic people are the most religious people in the United States. I didn't know that. I don't know how they figured it out. But that's their statement. So let's go with that. So what part of our culture do we need to leave behind? Because another part of the culture feels that's too religious for them. Where does that line get where does that line become a thick line where you can't do certain things? Uh, I just came back from Cuba in March um, following uh, an exhibition that the Pope had established in Cuba. And we went to, uh, to close that exhibition on the Bible. So in Cuba, religious activities must be done in the church. Religious conversations should not be had. Religious influence of social doctrines or social positions should not be discussed in public. I guess that's one extreme. And another extreme is where the religious leaders make the rules for everyone. In between those two extremes, we have to find our space. And my concern is that we're moving closer and closer to a Cuban discussion when I discuss the role of faith in with my liberal friends. So that is part of a conversation that we need to continue to have. And I think it's very important. What will religion in the public square be? How will we, as a society, allow for it as a basic freedom, as a basic right of individuals? And once you decide that conversation, it will, in fact, affect what is the role of government working with religious groups 
working with religious groups to better society. And to date, we've always had that, um, that has kind of worked. It's never been easy. It's been a difficult dialogue in one sense, but we put the line in something called proselytism. So the idea is you, the government can work with and alongside religion to do good for communities and individuals, but the government will not foster a religion, meaning it will not foster uh, proselytism of any religious group, therefore not taking a position of, of saying this religion is better than another. Now, this concept is rooted in this book, because I saw this happen on television, and it really worked. <laughs> it's rooted in this book. And if you don't have one, we'll get you one. But it really worked better when I saw it last time. <laughs> so if it is rooted, that's the Constitution of the United States. And it's rooted in that thought that government will not foster and will not inhibit and work alongside. It wasn't the Bible. I'm sorry. That's the other book. <laughs> As a Baptist minister, the other book is the Bible, too. It could, it could uh, be, yes, yeah. it could be, it could be. Then the other question is on immigration, and I'll, give a, I'll try to give a quick story on immigration and the role of religion. Uh, the White House asked me to lead a delegation to Honduras when we were getting unaccompanied children to the borders of the United States. The bulk of the children were coming from Guatemala and from Honduras. And so I led a, a, a religious delegation of religious Hispanic leaders to two countries. And I kept wondering why, you know, like, why? And after I met with the State Department, I met with the, you meet with the different departments. Uh, four or five, you get totally confused because they all give you com uh, contradictory information. But there was one thing that was common with all of them. They all told me that I needed to visit this site, please leave by 3 o'clock. But no one would tell me why. And when I met with the First Lady of Honduras, uh, a site in Tegucigalpa, which is a community center that is built with USAID money, uh, partially with USAID money. So when I meet with the first lady, she says, I understand you're going to the center. And, and I said, yes, I'm really excited to go tomorrow. She says, please be sure to leave by 3 o'clock. Now I'm... <laughs> so I, have, I asked a question to uh, the local USAID staffer. And he says, well, Reverend, uh, they shoot people who are strangers after 3. And the only people allowed in the area are religious. Hence, you were chosen. Barack Obama never said that to me before I was sent. But that's the role of religion. It can sometimes get in where no one else can. It can create dialogue from faith leaders in the United States to faith leaders in Honduras about a community that is besieged. And for whatever reason, good or bad, we were the only ones who could get in. That role must be fostered. It must grow. It is part, sometimes it is the only way to have a true dialogue. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Rabbi, um, uh, as I mentioned to you uh, in our pre-conference, uh, pre-panel uh, little gathering, I, uh, I serve on the board of the Penn Hillel. Uh, here at Penn, uh, even though I, I am a Roman Catholic, uh, so I'm the, I'm not the token because I have a pretty important job there working with students, and we are at the Penn Hillel a community of communities, uh, Orthodox students, Reform, all different Jewish identities represented. But one notices when being a part of such a community that the intra-faith dialogue can sometimes be as acute as the inter-faith uh, dialogue or the dialogue between people of faith and people who are uh, uh, secular in their orientation. And the thing that we hear most often from students generally in, in our environment when it comes to religion, while recognizing the great works that religions have done around the world, the role of religions that religions played in some cases in democratizing, uh, the role of religion in ser social services, we have in America a phenomenon of growing number of young people who are characterized by the same pew research group as nuns. Now, when I first heard this, that 15% of Americans were nuns, I got very excited. I thought, oh, gee, the Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters are taking over the country. 15% uh, of America, but they're not that kind of nuns. So the N-O-N-E-S is nuns, people who have de-aligned from religion entirely. 
And why, why the millennials are, are de-aligning, this is my question to you. You talk to these young people, again, in an environment like ours here at Penn, and they say, many of them, isn't religion primarily a force for oppression? Mm -hmm. Isn't religion, uh, you know, if you're progressive or you're feminist or LGBT, why, why would you want to continue with any of these religious traditions? Now, your congregation has been, a, as I said, a tremendous force for promoting dialogue and action on equality and justice issues. But tell me how to answer the, these young folks. Uh, what, what directions do we point them in, or what would be your answer to them? It's, I think, at the core of, of my life is answering that question, uh, beginning, first of all, for me. Uh, for, it's an important question for me to answer as somebody who comes from an activist background and who cares deeply about progressive values and of creating a world in which justice and peace is a dominant value. Um, I'll tell you a couple of stories to get to the answer. One uh, is that I myself have an orthodox background. I grew up in a conservative Jewish family, went to an orthodox yeshiva high school, became very religious. And uh, from both of, those uh, both of those experiences, I learned different things about what it is to be Jewish. And then I went to college where I became very politically active, and this was in the early and mid-70s, and I became very active. And every one of the groups I would go to, we would go around a circle, people would introduce themselves, and it turned out the activists were pretty much either Catholics or Jews. And the Catholics going around the circle would say, my political activism comes from my faith, that, I, uh, that Jesus really uh, inspires me, speaks to me, demands of me to do this. And the Jews would typically say, I'm an activist, I happen to be Jewish, but it's not really, part, it's not really important to me. And because of, I came from a religious Jewish background, that gap deeply disturbed me. Because I do believe that Judaism has a profound amount to offer. And that was my, started me off on this road of trying to understand how the two can come together. And then in the process of that road, I ended up working with a lot of people from many different faiths. Um, and since, uh, and I don't want to echo what the, my colleagues have said, how moving and moved I am to be here at a, uh, the uh, Perry World House, which is dedicated to this idea of bringing together uh, different life stories, different intellectual traditions, different uh, perspectives in order to try and understand that not one of us is going to bring the truth but maybe by opening up a platform in which many truths can be explored through many different prisms, we might be able to expand to get to some place we couldn't have gotten to without each other. So I'm profoundly grateful to be a part of this conversation. You know, Will Herberg wrote a very famous book for those of us who are students of religion in the 1950s called Pro uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. And that was his analysis of American religious life. Protestant, Catholic, Jew, that was what the academic world perceived to be the definition of the American religious uh, universe. Now, in that book, he described these three categories. Uh, as a Jew, I didn't know there was a difference between Protestants and Catholics at that point when I first studied the book. And so you, those of you who are Protestant Catholics should know not all of us even understand there's a difference. We just see Christianity. And then you get deeper and deeper and understand, talk about intra-conflict, and in that book, he describes these silos in which Protestants, Catholics, and Jews existed in the 50s understanding of American religious life, completely separated in social, in religious, in cultural, in neighborhoods, in every way. Today, I would say, we obviously understand American religious life very differently. First of all, we add many different religions to understand what the American religious landscape looks like. But I would add another feature to that, which is how I have come to understand some of the importance of where we are today, which is that the silos or the categories are no longer these vertical ones which separate Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, but rather they're also, I would imagine them to be horizontal, separating those who are, how shall we say, fundamentalists or um, literalists in our appreciation of our religious traditions and those who land ourselves in the progressive interpretations of those religious traditions. So I sometimes find myself having more uh, alignment with progressive Protestants or Catholics or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists than I might with a uh, fundamentalist or a, uh, somebody from my own Jewish tradition 
who interprets or sees themselves aligned differently. And we see that happening all over the world. I mean, Mel Gibson is a great example in terms of what Catholics, where Catholics and Protestants might find each other aligned, which in the 50s would have been unimaginable. Um, so for me, it gets to the root of wanting to work in concert and connection with the progressive voices of other religious traditions because I believe the right-wing voices of those other religious traditions have understood that by linking themselves together create a tremendous political force, not just in this country, but internationally. And where there are deep differences, I'm not superficial about those deep differences, with a progressive Muslim, I can engage in really deep conversations about religion and issues of Islamophobia, issues of anti-Semitism. I can engage in deep questions about the issues around Palestine and Israel and stay engaged in conversation, which is impossible to do if I'm speaking to a, or it would be impossible for that kind of Muslim who defines themselves as being uh, so far to the whatever word you would use, Islamist, fundamentalist, we wouldn't be able to engage. I'm a lesbian rabbi, you know, from New York City. So I'm willing to sit down with people who disagree with me, uncomfortable with me, want to debate it, but to get to the point of being able to sit down requires a level of connectedness. And I'm going to say something that might be considered very radical. I want to focus on the people with whom I can engage across all religious uh, denominations, and I want to engage with all different kinds of communities. But I want to say that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to reach across the line uh, to those who are so far to the right that their image of what the world would look like in their perfect analysis would not include me in any way. I'm going to say, you know what? Let's not focus on them. Let's focus on those with whom we can build deep and profound and challenging and provocative connections and not trying to erase differences, but it'd be in that place. Susan Beresford, who uh, led the Ford Foundation for many years, described when she became, first became president of the Ford Foundation, she said she had one requirement, which is that she wanted a six month sabbatical in which she would visit every office of the Ford Foundation around the world. And she said over those six months, she visited every single office and asked her program officers one question. What's the greatest impediment to the work you are doing? This is Malaysia, South Africa, uh, Latin America, North America, all over the world. What's the greatest impediment? And every single one of them said the force of religion in our particular culture, in our particular moment, in our particular place. And what her takeaway was not, therefore, religion is bad, she then understood, she asked them, what is the greatest force for liberation in your particular cultural context, continents, societies? And they equally said the forces of progressive religion. And her, what she took from that is what inspires the core of my life's work, which is that we have to amplify the voices of progressive religion in all different places in the world. Those and I, and you know, we have only a few minutes, so I'm being using some buzzwords here. But we have to ample, we have to find ways for people to reach out across what are seen as divisions, but share a progressive view of their own religious traditions and trust. We will across all of these very big, in some cases, differences, because the shared progressive values of creating a universe in which each other can exist and flourish in peace and dignity and justice is more important than letting those differences absolutely drown that out. So here, this comes back to these young students that uh, likewise see because why is it that right-wing religious values have hijacked religion all over the world? And starting to here in the United States, maybe not starting to, it's always been a thread of American culture, but as you pointed out, it's certainly... Uh, and I think that progressives, including progressive religious people, are too namby-pamby about claiming our space. And we're too ashamed of saying, I speak for God also. I'm proud. I'm a religious person. I, deep, I believe deeply in the Bible and in God and in following God's path. But what I believe that path to be is quite different from what those on the radical religious right have done. And I think they have hijacked and stolen the language of religion from 
much of us, and we have to be bolder, and we have to be out there saying, God demands that we are protecting the immigrant. God demands that we are making sure that the poor are fed and that our social services in this country actually take care of human beings first. God demands this of us, no less than that. And I think that liberals are just uh, too ashamed or too weak or are too afraid to be able to use that language as well. And we have to uh, put our resources, our time resources, our money resources, our social capital, our intellectual capital. And a place like Perry World House is very important precisely because there are too few places which bring those of us who care about these issues together to be able to go somewhere deep. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much, Rabbi. So I only have about 3,000 questions I'd like to <laughs> ask uh, the panel. But I only, uh, there's two I'm going to definitely try to sneak in before we open to the audience. But before I do that, uh, not the conventional way to moderate, but would any of the panelists like to ask any of the other panelists a question or comment on what they've heard? Maybe. <laughs> Going uh, once, twice? Mr. Mr. Watson. Please. I defer to you first, of course, if you have something to say, please. Well, what uh, is your idea about the problem of climate change? Because this is one of the things that we need to have a common vision, like the question of the eradication of the new form of slaves. There are emergencies that are very, very strong. And I think that we can act together to these two very important uh, emergencies and to, have, to, give, to bring solutions, because also we can give some kind of synergy to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, what is your idea? I know that many rabbis, uh, for example, that I know are completely in agreement with this statement. But I don't know if all the community of the rabbis and all the community of Muslims or also Christians, in general Christians, are agree. What are your ideas? I think climate change is an excellent example of a, an issue on which progressive values that I believe in can cross religious lines, and especially because those who often speak against the concept of climate change are using are doing it in the name of religion against science, it becomes all the more important for those religious voices um, to say, no, no, I am a deeply religious person. I believe in God. And yes, um, I think climate change is a real and uh, pressing danger to our universe. So I think the religious voices are very important to be out there. Thank you. Yes, I, I just wanted to also say that I, of course, which is I hope between the lines of what I said, uh, endorse entirely uh, your point, Rabbi, about the fact that the new fault lines, I think, must be between those who would rather dictate their views on others in the name of religion uh, and those who seek a way to reconcile uh, religion with tolerant and pluralistic values. And the only appeal I would make is that currently within my own Muslim communities in the plural, of course, Muslims have their own various intra-faith and heated intra-faith conversations so I use communities in the plural deliberately, uh, there is a, often a lack of awareness as to exactly where this debate is within Muslim communities. And it's actually quite premature. And we have to be very, very candid about that. To give you one example again from UK statistics, um, but it's not, though it is better here in America, it's still not, you know, it's still not where it should be. But when polled this year alone, uh, 52% of British Muslims said they would ban homosexuality. Because you refer to this as a point, as an example of where you're finding some tension. That 52% also happens to be, overall, a 3% minority in the country. So now we face a paradox in that they're also facing uh, anti-Muslim bigotry from the wider European climate. And it's often the case that a minority community, imagine, for example, early Jewish immigration to uh, Britain or generally anywhere, uh, if they were ultra-Orthodox in their views, they may harbor some bigotry towards others while still needing protection from mainstream society. And that is a huge paradox because uh, I, I talk a lot about the minorities within the minorities. There are people within Muslim communities who are stigmatized by their fellow Muslims regardless of denomination, whether they're gay Muslims, ex-Muslims, feminist Muslims, liberal, 
outspoken Muslims or Muslims from sects uh, that are not recognized, uh, that are seen as heterodox, like the Ahmadis, who are, uh, an Ahmadi chap was killed in the UK. Uh, in fact, just two days ago, there was a conviction for uh, uh, ISIS supporting Muslim in the UK in Rochdale who murdered a mosque imam for practicing a version of Sufi Islam. So these, uh, th we have this challenge that um, the struggle for progressive values within Muslim communities right now is so fierce as defined by ISIS and what they're doing that sometimes the outside, or let's say outside world, other communities find it difficult to identify those progressive voices within Muslim communities because they are frankly few and far between. And they end up prioritizing another very, very important thing, which is protecting the rights of those minorities over seeking those progressive voices within the minorities. And there is that tension there, as I've just attempted to elaborate on. And so what I would ask is, is to be cognizant of that dimension, so that when seeking alliances from within Muslim communities uh, who are progressive, recognize that, that they are a tiny minority who are oppressed by the larger minority progressives in the West are rightfully seeking to protect. Um, and that requires some very difficult conversations. And to navigate our way through that can be incredibly complicated. Taz, I could see that you want to say something. Yes, yeah. uh, Hispanics in the US believe in trying to fight climate change. We start with the environmental issues that are local. We have the highest incidence of asthma. We have the highest incidence of diabetes, mostly because of environmental issues. Uh, local environmental issues. The Hispanic evangelical group, uh, which I'm here representing, is a different group from the traditional evangelical group. We're throwing away, around terms like liberal, and conservative, evangelical. Um, very much, uh, I, I would have to say, um, uh, the Hispanic evangelical group to be defined is, is difficult. We're very progressive in certain areas and not in others. And so we're part of the culture wars. We're also part of the civil rights war, so it's a really uh, eclectic group. And on climate change, a lot of our leadership actually went to England uh, and met with uh, some of the social scientists in England at, at the request of Prince Charles, and we made a statement and a declaration there when we met with him that has led for there being radical change already uh, locally, um, and that led to the Anglo portion of, of evangelicals called the National Association of Evangelicals, which is a white evangelical organization to join in on the climate change debate. So there are changes, and my only concern is um, I agree that more needs to be done on the progressive wing, but if there is no dialogue, then it's about who has more, and whoever has more of whatever that more is, is needed to win, they win. And so I, I really think this is more about framing conversations the right way mm -hmm. and about dialoguing on these conversations and finding the willing partner mm -hmm. on the other side so that we can begin to have uh, the conversation that would actually lead to change. I want to add one thing, and I think that's, cr that's a critical point, and what you've also raised is that progressive doesn't mean there has to be a checklist by which everybody has to agree on anything. For instance, I'm thrilled to work with uh, the Catholic Church on issues of climate change and economic justice, even while I might disagree on other issues. That doesn't mean I won't work with, and I think that kind of, um, uh, we have to find the places where we're gonna work together, and that's what coalition work is about, and that can't, and that, that basic principle of coalition work has to apply to religious communities also, and I'm very comfortable with that, and I think, it's a, I think that's a strength of, of of great, of good political work, and that should be true in religion as well as other civic society kinds of groups. Uh, this issue of what I call sort of the ecumenism of the trenches mm -hmm. uh, on different issues, whether climate change or I don't know where, if it came from what organization, your organization, uh, Reverend Cortez, creation care, as it's sometimes re referred to, uh, or issues of social welfare, uh, poverty, or on the other side with the cultural issues, different alignments that cut across religious groups. I want to ask, though, about the reporting. I want to ask each of you, uh, if any one of you want to take this on, a question about how religion is reported on around the world or here in the United States. And let me just tee this up with a, a very brief anecdote. I just got back from China. As uh, the dean mentioned, I've been there 
I've, you know, just six times in the last couple of years, I'd never been there before. And before I went, I did, I read up a lot on a lot of things that interest me, including religion in China. And the dominant view uh, was basically, uh, as reported by certain outlets in the U.S., was that uh, there was a, a wave of religious persecution going on in China, uh, pulling down crosses among the Christian groups and so forth and so on. And I believe that is true on the one hand. But on the other hand, while in China most recently, uh, I was in Suzhou, uh, China, where I was, uh, went to a Roman Catholic church uh, in Suzhou, a cathedral uh, that had, it's on a lake, um, and it had the largest statue of Jesus I think I've ever seen, uh, about equivalent to the Sam Houston statue in Houston. I mean, it is towering, and you can see it for miles. Also, another part of the same uh, province, a cross on the same lake, which could be seen for miles that had not been pulled down. And in talking to people, I came away with a much more complicated mm -hmm. you know, understanding of what's going on there uh, I I with respect to religion. And I think the question for, you, for each of you is, how satisfied, or if you, if you could modify or change one aspect of the way religion in general is covered, or your particular religious tradition is covered, what would it be? And how do you think, how religion is not generally a prized beat for reporters. It hasn't been. It's, it's not been the prized beat, you know, the way the, covering the White House or politics is. So covering religion, media coverage of religion, what are your views? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. jump in there. Um, nuance. There is none. But that's just part of the American fabric, isn't it? Um, there's no nuance. So normally religion is approached to as negative, on MSNBC and as positive on Fox. How's that? And so it, that about well, covers it, right? Yeah. And then there's no nuance on either side. So, and there's very, the other side to that is um, religion is a human endeavor. And as such, it will be human in its actions. And bad things happen that religious people do. Those will be highlighted when religious people do good things, that's what they're supposed to do, so it isn't kind of highlighted. And as a result of that, um, I think in the press, there's a scored notion of faith and spirituality. It's scored, uh, the messaging is, they're really just all, there's too many hypocrites, not all, but there's too many hypocrites in the religious sphere, and maybe they are, but that seems to be the messaging. And, um, um, then the religious group that fits my political identity is the one I will uphold, and there's no nuance. So the religious right is all evil, or the religious left is all evil, depending, or they're all good, depending on the perspective of the reporter. And I think that is a disservice to what's actually happening at the grassroots, where in this city, we have a great interfaith uh, relationship with about 15 different religions, we support each other. When a pig's head was sent, um, and some of you who are from the city know, a pig's head was cut off and thrown in front of a mosque in my community. It was, was not the Muslims that rallied. The Muslims kind of were afraid and pulled back. It were the Hispanic Christians that rallied, and then the Catholic Church and others. So at the grassroots sometimes, things are much better than what is perceived at the press, which has a different role of ratings. Well, I think that uh, it's very important today to accept the, 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 the value of the knowledge of sciences. And uh, you say it's reported or not. Uh, I, of course, uh, the, the, in the, for example, the Pope Francis in the encyclical Laudato Si, quoted and say in the paragraph 23, uh, as the co community of science say, because uh, of course he, he have a very good community of science in the academy, but he followed this idea. And, and I think that all the religious have, and uh, of course I say my, my, my friend here, the, the great tradition of Muslims was very important in science in the past. And, uh, and uh, the religion provoked science. In the, the original science is also the religion. In the end, in the end, it was a uh, comprove. And, uh, and, and we need to, today to have 
uh, we, we say reason and faith together. But reason today is not only the philosophic reason, it's also the scientific reason, and, and we need to follow this. We, we all in our tradition more or less have the idea that the human being is the steward of creation or, or is the steward. Uh, but, but to know what is exactly the situation, I don't say creation because it's very big, we don't know exactly, but of the, of the air, we need, we need scientists. We can have intuitions like many people to uh, work in agriculture, but this intuition has some reason really with scientists. And, and this is, I think, is important because it's part of the truth, part of the truth. Speaking of science, my other question for, for any one of you, for all of you, if you'd like to, uh, to give an answer, has to do with the role of the academy, the role of academic institutions in addressing issues of religion globally, religion and politics and, and world affairs. And the question, the way I'd pose it to you is this, if you could direct um, academic institutions like the University of Pennsylvania and like our brand new, wonderful Perry World House, if you could direct them to contribute what they can uh, by way of academic, scientific, empirical research, or as neutral conveners for discussions like the one we're, we're initiating here today, uh, or perhaps in exploring approaches to particular problems, social problems, uh, environmental problems, what would you have them do? What do you think might be the particular comparative advantage or value of academic institutions in addressing issues of religion and global affairs? I know it's a broad question, but I suspect you have some, some keen thoughts on that as well. Well, it's a safe space. And yeah. I think that's neutral. It's neutral. Uh, very, very important. There are very few safe spaces, yeah. right? And if you're going to meet on an issue, the rules of engagement are always very important. And um, you don't want to go to a place that you don't feel safe. You don't want to go to a place where things, the rules of engagement are not clear. So a place like this, uh, which is doing it right now, uh, can continue to do that. And I think there are different levels of that. Um, what works is a really important conversation for this country because we always focus on what doesn't work. And, but we build on what works. And so I really feel that no one's really looking at uh, what works in the United States, right? This is a social experiment. We've reached this point in our history, what is the role of religion and what has worked? What has been good about it? Um, I really think that conversation and how to foster the, good, the growth of goodness is a really important conversation for this nation as we go forward because it, it deals with the issues of ethics and morality. And what better place to do it than in a place that uh, not only sanctions ethics and morality, but dialogues about it in, in a form that can be an open forum. It's very important, uh, the, the, the influence of religion, because it's clear that religion created the ethics and the, and the values in, 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 in the history. And, uh, and I don't know what would be the reason, but the United Nations came to our academy to have meetings and to fortify the statement that they do. And this is a new thing, because we are in some moment uh, to, to, to change the idea to the, to the completely uh, secularism that, uh, that the religion had nothing to, to say. And was in the past, you say, it's a traditional knowledge. But what is traditional knowledge? <laughs> it's not a traditional knowledge. It's a traditional knowledge, but it's a real, very important knowledge for the values and also for some vision of the world with Nwazim. some integrity. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Nawaz, and then Rabbi. I want to go back to your point on the media, because mm. I didn't get a chance to comment on that. And I'm really, um, it's, I'm happy you said what you said, actually, Reverend, about the polarization in the political spectrum. And uh, what you said, that if you wanted just to take that back to your words, that MSNBC, religion bad, Fox, religion good, if you flip that for Muslims, um, it's the other way around, yeah. right? So MSNBC, Muslims are always good, and Fox, Muslims are always bad. And, you know, it, the problem is, of course, um, the reason we have that opposite way around is because of my previous comments to you, Rabbi, about the nature of the progressives and their approach to minority communities. Wishing to protect minority communities is the instinctive reaction. And on the right, you know, perhaps xenophobia is a more comfortable place to be. 
but actually that nuance is so important. Muslims are not always the victims. And, and that's where MSNBC gets it wrong. Muslims are not always the victims. In many instances, those within my own communities are the perpetrators of some incredible levels of bigotry, uh, justified by their own interpretations of my own religion. And then likewise, uh, in the opposite side, Muslims aren't always the enemy either. And so part of it is so frustrating that in this uh, dialogue I refer to in my opening remarks, um, as a liberal progressive advocate for reform within my own religion, I was expecting resistance from the far right. And that's something which I've always had growing up in, in the UK as well, including neo-Nazi attacks. And it's something I've come to become accustomed to. Um, uh, uh, populism is something I, you know, uh, and it's on the rise at the moment, is something that I was expecting to be something that would be anim anim hold animosity towards the sort of work that I'm encouraging. Uh, what I hadn't expected around eight years ago when we founded Quilliam was animosity from those on the left who weren't comfortable with opening up this conversation about the need for reform within Muslim communities uh, because they were blind to the fact that uh, within those Muslim communities, there could also be bigotry. And it's a form of the bigotry. It, this attitude towards Muslims is what I call the bigotry of low expectations. The, uh, the uh, dropping of standards, uh, a lack of an expectation that liberalism can thrive within Muslim communities because somehow that m savage is always going to be a savage. So let's just protect uh, the savage's right to be a savage and fight the right wing who wants to demonize them. And that's a very patronizing attitude as well. But you find that on the left of our media. And it all comes down to a lack of nuance. The truth is, like anyone else, Muslims are not a monolith. We're not homo uh, homogenous. We have the good and the bad within us. And we're not always the victim. In some cases, we can be the bigots too. And we have to open up and throw open that debate. And as comfortable as I would feel sitting here on this panel uh, and to say that, you know, Christian fundamentalists in the Bible Belt need to be challenged because I'm a liberal and a progressive and I speak from that platform. And I would have, nobody in this audience would accuse me of being anti-Christian if I said that, because they understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but I want, as comfortable as I would feel saying that about Christian fundamentalists in the Bible Belt, I would want a non-Muslim to feel as comfortable speaking in that way about Muslim theocrats within my own communities. But at the moment, frankly, they don't feel comfortable doing so. Of course, of course. Um. Uh, I really appreciate your point, and that is my point, that we have to really f understand the real kind of enemies, so to speak, are now cross-religious traditions, and we have to be comfortable really identifying them. Um, but to the point of what the role of the academy, religion has a peculiar structure that the academy has not in, in general interfaced with, which, in which I think there is tremendous opportunity and that is, by and large, religion is structured in congregations that reaches a lot of people. And the people who lead these congregations, myself included, um, the gap between congregational leaders and the academy are huge. It's, they, that gap is huge. And those are the people who are reaching uh, the vast majority of religious people are those congregational leaders. And by and large, and again, this is a big generalization lacking nuance in a conversation where we're talking about nuance, by and large, congregational leaders do all of their um, intellectual, professional, spirit spiritual development after seminary inside of their own institutions. And they don't have a lot of um, exposure to the intellectual life of other traditions or of the academy. And I think that there would be a fantastic role for somebody to play, and maybe it will be the Perry World House, of having two-day institutes for congregational leaders to learn from the academics who are working here at Penn in religion and politics. Um, and that doesn't exist. For the academics to learn from them as well. Uh, perhaps, I'm, I'm, there's, that could work yeah. as well. Yeah. That gap is unbelievable to me that, uh, that there's almost no, and these leaders who are the ones who are preaching and teaching and doing the pastoral work with the people out there don't benefit from the intellectual life, the uh, papers, the thinking, the think tanks that are happening on campuses. I know that uh, my colleagues, Bill Burke White and, and Mike Horowitz of Perry Roadhouse, were sharpening their pencils as you all were, were, were talking. Um, yes, Mr. Nawaz, yeah. Yep, as well, please. which I didn't get a chance to, I know I'll be very brief, don't worry, is that, um, it, this, this trend that we're witnessing um, of perhaps shutting down the debate on campuses and on universities, I believe, is unhelpful for the sorts of conversations I think 
Muslim communities need to be having. A, look, a critique, a scrutiny of any idea, including any religious idea, is not, in the case of Islam, is not Islamophobia. Um, Islam of, is, you know, anti-Muslim bigotry is very real, but it's not anti-Muslim bigotry to open up a conversation around, for example, levels of homophobia among Muslim communities. We've got to be able to distinguish between scrutinizing an idea, even a deeply held religious idea, and stigmatizing a person for identifying in any one way, such as being a Muslim. And unfortunately, what's happening on campuses in the UK, in the US, across Western campuses, in fact, um, in the name of safe, safe spaces, um, is a shutting down of that conversation uh, from a born again of a desire of wanting to protect. But in fact, it's, you know, there is a sensible way of having this conversation. And if we don't have it, if we liberals don't have it in a sensible way, then we do leave the door open. And I believe this is exactly what's happened in Europe with the rise of pop the populist right and in the United States. We leave the door open for those uh, who want to have it in a more bigoted way. Uh, because that frustration boils up to such an extent that eventually it, it boils over. And people say, I can't talk about this because you're being politically correct. And then they think, they then conflate saying falsehoods with wanting, not wanting to be politically correct. And they're obviously not the same thing, yeah? You know, all right, fine, let's shed this desire to be politically correct. That doesn't mean you shed the desire or the responsibility to actually be in accordance to facts. Uh, but they make that conflation because I don't think liberals have been having this conversation in a sensible way. I'm going to turn to the audience now for questions, but I just have to say, uh, in response, what wonderful uh, panel, uh, what a wonderful panel discussion. But I think the University of Pennsylvania and our Perry World House may be the ideal place uh, to do this. It goes back to our founder, mm -hmm. St. Benjamin Franklin. Um, uh, uh, Perry World House is his third miracle Monsignor. So we're looking for, uh, we need some help. Uh, we need some help. Uh, but, you know, he gave a, a motto to the Library Company of Philadelphia. He didn't give it to the College of Philadelphia, uh, now the University of Pennsylvania, which was, and I, I'm a, I'm a post-Vatican II altar boy, so I don't have the Latin, but it was in Latin, and it translates in English as, to pour forth benefits for the common good is divine. Mm -hmm. To pour forth benefits mm -hmm. for the common good is divine. And on, there you go. <laughs> All right, so the floor is open. I know there's a microphone somewhere to come around. So where is our, our microphone? You come on up here and we'll go right, we'll start in the first row. I will try to be ecumenical and going across and around, but uh, time may not allow. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Go left, right. Hi, my name is Matthew Sada, and I'm alumnus 2002 of the University of Pennsylvania. I'm currently serving as an American diplomat. And I wanted to ask uh, you on the panel, perhaps for a personal observation or reflection, on how you've seen religion and diplomacy come together. Our Secretary of State, John Kerry, has made religion uh, very important in his outreach to leaders, and you know the Vatican has played an important role in opening up relations with certain countries. But I'm curious, uh, not so much on the domestic front, again, building coalitions to address social issues, but on the global platform, be it on climate change, COP21, but perhaps each one of you are uh, whoever is so uh, inclined could provide an example of, again, how religion and diplomacy have come together and how you've maybe interacted with some of our diplomats, be it from whichever country you're representing. I think, for example, for these emergencies that we can say the more important are the climate change and the question of the new form of slaves, that is a terrible situation when we try to understand the problem. And uh, we, we are already work together to, to, in a, to, in a form to, to move to all the society to try to be awareness about the problems. And uh, of course, uh, to, to suggested solution for this. And uh, for example, uh, we invited with religious leaders in the academy, we invited judges of all the world to understand what is the praxis in, in, in the application of the law for the human trafficking and also for climate change. We invited also mayors of the more important cities 
of the world to, 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 to speak about this and what are, we, we organize a, a, a summit of this with conclusions to, to be more awareness but also to have more international laws to, to more easy go to the problems and to take the traffickers. And we invited also the new forms of the new government. For example, we admire the, 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 the new law of the, of the model, which we say the Sweden model, to not only for the question of the traffickers, not only go against traffickers and against the pumps, but also the consumers to use this because created the market. And, uh, and this was very important to have together religious leaders with judges, religious leaders with mayors, religious leaders we can organize with the governance. And, and this, we, we, we go to there to, to convince all the society to the problems and the solutions that we can make. So, so my experience has been it's been more back channel type of work, not a delegation. The only delegation I let I mentioned but I've done, um, Hispanics have done back channel work with the Mexican president and the US president. Uh, we also, we've also done work with the president of Panama when Torrijos was the president and, um, and this country. Uh, and we're doing some, some things now with Cuba. Um, and the president of Venezuela is coming to New York to meet specifically with Hispanic religious leaders. So it's happening, but it isn't our government. It's more uh, uh, Latin American or Hispanic peoples in the US with uh, political leaders of our countries, the different countries. And then we'll go to another question. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Secretary Kerry set up a special working group on LGBT and faith uh, groups internationally, which I serve on that um, working group. And in that group, there is a lot of work being done, again, very back channel, to link up and to develop religious connections between religious leaders here in the United States and religious leaders in the countries in, around the world in which LGBT folks are under attack. And that's um, the effectiveness of that. Who knows what it'll be? But that's uh, really a result of Secretary Kerry's setting this working group up and bringing together nationally a group of LGBT and religious leaders to think that through. So that's an example of really important work happening. Thank you. Another question. Uh, yes. Microphone coming. Miraculously appears. Here it is. Thank you. Uh, my, my question to, uh, to Monsignor Marsalo. Uh, it's very simple, Marsalo. Uh, Professor uh, Monsignor Marsalo. Uh, you, uh, is it possible for an existentialist to understand history and religion? Professor Professor John here, uh, he, he, he was wondering why young people doesn't understand religion, doesn't buy into religion. Mm -hmm. My question is because we raise them as existentialists, and existentialists doesn't buy into either religion or history. They don't take it. They, they wanted to rewrite history, and they wanted to just to, they wanted to have Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad right now in order to take it. So my question, for, philosophically speaking, Professor, um, is it possible for an existentialist to understand religion and history? We have the first, we have the first, um, the first existential idealist pope. It was uh, John, John Paul II. We have the second existential idealist Paul that combined existentialism and and, 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 and idealism in their governance of the church. But, but from there, we almost went downhill. My question is still. That, that question goes way above my pay grade. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but we have it's people here who can answer it. was very clear. Monsignor, please it's give my answer me. to that question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, uh. if I understand well, because my English is not so perfect of your English, because my mother language is Spanish. Uh, but if I understand well, you speak about the put together the existence, the philosophy, existential philosophy and religion. But the father of the existentialism is Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard was a great religious man. 
and 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 try to put together in the in the very syntactic things the religion. Uh, you need to read the, the books of Kierkegaard. That is the father of the existentialist. Have to continue this dialogue. Uh, no problem. Over the next hundred it's years. Just the contrary. Uh, uh, but are born together. Born together. It's a great topic. Th thank you. Anyone else want to take on existentialism and religion? Okay. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. All right. Other question. We're almost out of time, but please. Hi, my name is Alan Luxemburg with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. My question is for Rabbi Kleinbaum. Uh, the way you painted the, land, the political landscape is that there is a progressive left and then there's the radical right. I didn't get the feeling there was any room in your narrative for all the people in the middle who may be religious but are definitely not radical or militant or fundamentalist may not buy into all of the progressive left. And it sounded at one point that you were happy to share the dialogue with all those cross religions, but only if they shared certain of your premises and you weren't really interested in engaging people outside of that universe. And then at one point you referred to enemies and I thought you sounded like you were referring to people who were on the right somewhere not even, I'm not sure where. So my question is, is the progressive left really interested in having a dialogue with people who don't share its premises? So first of all, I didn't say progressive left, I said progressive religious traditions, which in that, and again, I had five to seven minutes, I was, as I, and I asked for an excuse, to be excused for some jargon in order to get to the point. Progressive religious traditions are a broad definition. That is not a very, that is not, I didn't mean there's only one point on progressive de definition, but I was making the distinction between those who see a liberal interpretation of their religious traditions and those who see a strict, and it's different, and again, I would have to say, if I was giving a long talk on this, and I do have a long talk, of a version of this, there's very different definitions of what fundamentalism is in Judaism and what fundamentalism is in Christian traditions or in Islam. These are very different definitions. But broadly speaking, and I was doing that for the purpose of creating a Will Herberg division that's a little, to kind of put it on its head really, to say that those in the broad perspective who don't see themselves in one very broad category have sometimes more alignment with each other than the silos of Herberg's 50s, 1950s America. And across those places, we have much more in common at this stage of history than we do sometimes with those of our own religious traditions who are on the extremes of those positions. And yes, I do believe that the power of change is gonna happen not only by reaching across, I'm very available to talk to anybody who's interested, but often the cases we've been left out because we are considered the heretics or the infidels or the, or, or the, um, or what? The other. the other. We're the ones who are usually defined by those religious voices who have the power of tradition behind them as excluded. And I was making the argument, and yes, and maybe it was a little too, too harsh, that we shouldn't fear that in the sense of we should find a way to join together and create a very proactive, positive identity of those who are on that liberal end of things. Um, so that was my, and perhaps my words were a little inartful in order to try to create that. I've been excluded from Jewish tradition. Should I therefore say, I don't wanna be Jewish? No, I should find places to create a positive, not in reaction against, but say I can create a positive form of identity within my tradition and find many others in other traditions who have likewise been called the infidels or the heretics or the other. Because of the nature of the work I do with both sides of the aisle, I can honestly say both sides of the aisle uh, at, a, at their poles are extremely ideological, not religious. They, they have, um, and both sides of the aisle, using religious language, demonize the other. They just do. So when I'm with my conservative friends, they're like, how could they be so liberal? They don't believe God. And when I'm with my progressive friends, using that terminology, progressive, they're as fundamentalist 
in their thought as the other side. How could they be like that? They're evil. So there is a lot of work to do because, when, because most of the time, there's a lot more in common, but because of the polls, you can't have dialogue. And so Perry Warehouse has a very distinct mission if it wants it. I wouldn't, I'll pray for you. <laughs> it, it may be too late, but go and right for the ahead. dean. LaShawn uh, uh, <laughs> Jefferson, please uh, come on up. Deputy Director. Conversation. And so before I make some remarks about plans for Perry Rojas, I want to actually stop and give a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> All of the panels have been remarkable today, but I'm obviously a little bit partial since I'm following you all. Um, so I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about some plans, very exploratory plans that Perry World House has in two focal areas, being religion and uh, politics and um, women's global human rights. Um, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Bill to close the day. But I wanted to say that some of the things I was thinking as I was listening to this panel, and it directly relates to kind of the plans we're thinking about here at Perry World House, is um, the, har the really hard questions that the panel has asked today, including that there are actual areas of impasse. You know, that the hardest questions that we have to tackle in thinking about the planning that we do going forward aren't about whether religion should be a force of good. I think we can probably all agree that it should be. Isn't really whether uh, religious orders and groups should be involved in social services and delivering social services and bringing out the best in people because the answer to all of that is yes. The hard questions are really about where there is impasse and where there is fundamental disagreement about what constitutes social justice, what constitutes inclusion, what constitutes um, exclusion, and how obviously religion oftentimes and in various ways actually mask things that really are misogyny, dominance, patriarchy, and other ambitions. One of the things that I heard on this panel that I found very refreshing was in fact that there is the possibility of having not just continued interfaith dialogue, but taking back religion in some ways. I think that's a really serious question. How do people, individuals, reclaim religion for being a force broadly of good? And what do we mean when we say to reclaim religion and to make it into the thing that we think delivers social justice for the broadest number of people? So, um, you know, Perry World House, as this interdisciplinary hub for global engagement, has uh, or is developing this focal area with regard to religion as well as women's rights. And this panel brought to mind, obviously, the fact that there are fault lines across the different religions that have been represented here today, um, and that we can't, in fact, avoid those questions. The real question for us really is, can religion be more on the front lines of social stability, development, and inclusion? Where are the largest fault lines, and can they be repaired? Where, one of the panelists mentioned this, in fact. So where are their models worth examining? And can we use those models and use Perry Rollhouse, in fact, as a way to explore those models and apply them outside of the uh, university setting? Um, at this exploratory stage, we're very much trying to determine how best to shape our programming. And like the two research themes, the two focal areas will leverage the best thinking and academic research across Penn's 12 schools engage Penn students, policymakers, and thought leaders, and support um, policy engagement. And I think what that means in part is recognizing that we all don't have a common definition, in fact, of the effect of religion in our lives, and that our own ideas of what extremism means, for me as a women's rights activist, that it means a very particular set of facts about how women are held and their rights are held centrally in religion. For someone else, it might mean a whole set of other things about the environment or about access to certain types of resources. But being able to have that dialogue across um, religions, I think, is very important. Um, we're trying to figure out ways that can better pair the academic research that is happening within Penn and across the 12 schools to have those discussions internally to both bring together thinkers, provide a place. One of the uh, panelists also mentioned the fact that there's this chasm, in fact, between uh, religious thought or practitioners, frankly, and the academy. So how do you bring that together and provide those religious leaders, in fact, with a place to do some of their better thinking and to engage more with academics? And I think that Perry Rollhouse can, in fact, um, be the place for that. Um, 
one other point I wanted to make just about the uh, religious panel and maybe what we'll be doing in the future is um, this idea of secularism. I was surprised to hear it and happy to hear it in some ways, which is to say how do you balance the issue of secularism in public life when people are, have, um, have beliefs and want their religions to kind of form a part of their kind of public and private lives. And that is a kind of huge question because we certainly don't want the example that was posed, I guess, of Cuba where there can kind of be no public talk of religion, or do we? And so some, I, some of these questions I think um, we don't actually know the answers to, we uh, think we do, but we'll be exploring them at Perry Roll House. On the issue of global uh, women's rights, um, in terms of Perry World House's commitment to urgent global affairs and challenges, obviously I don't think there's any kind of more important uh, area than global women's rights. And we have right now a paradox of broad advances of women's human rights in many societies, yet persistent challenges, especially the chasm between laws, practices, and customs, and whether or not women's rights can actually be uh, implemented. And again, all over the world you've had advances in terms of law, so the question becomes, and the crucial question really is, what's stopping women's human rights from in fact being implemented? You have the UN at the highest levels being deeply engaged in different questions of women's human rights, and yet the difference between the law and the policy can sometimes be huge. Um, additionally, when it comes to looking at international women's human rights, you've had great advances looking at uh, violence against women as an example where you've had less work and less academic attention is in fact looking at women's rights in the economic sphere. And very specifically the issue of women's um, almost intentional and deliberate impoverishment. And I, and I do mean that as like a political choice that governments make that build um, entire societies and political systems on women's free labor or very cheap labor. And so a lot of people in the human rights community and the women's rights community have begun to look very closely at how do you increase women's economic autonomy as a right in and of itself, as well as a right that enables other rights. And I would say, particularly in light of the um, SDGs, that is absolutely a critical question for the academy and for civil society and for um, practitioners. The third area that we'll be exploring, um, we'll be looking at women's rights within the family. Um, and by this we mean looking at the ways that women experience violence and discrimination within the family and um, how their rights are curtailed and subject to male decision making. All of this is very exploratory. None of it will be done um, without engaging the broader Penn community and the faculty and researchers here. And we obviously look uh, forward to um, engaging all of you in, this, uh, in the planning. I see Bill to my left, um, and so I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to him to give you all instructions about tomorrow, and thank you very much. Thank you, LaShawn, and I just have to say I am so thrilled that she has joined us as our deputy director. We stole her from the Ford Foundation, and we are very lucky to have her. I also have to say, wow. That was the kind of panel that is a perfect embodiment of what we hope to be able to do at Perry World House. Thoughtful, substantive, challenging, engaging. I hope this is a conversation we can continue. I am truly grateful to John, perhaps the best moderator in the world. Um, and four leaders whose spirituality and wisdom hopefully can guide us going forward. I also want to thank all of you for coming today. Tomorrow morning, I invite you to reconvene here at Perry World House for breakfast from 9 to 10 and a keynote address by Navi Pillay, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, and a ribbon cutting ceremony with Dr. Gutman as we formally open Perry World House. And then to join us again at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon at the Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts for a dedication program headlined by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates uh, and a group of America's foreign policy leaders from both sides of the aisle. So with that, I'm delighted to conclude the first day of Perry World House's opening and look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you.